morning, St Mark's, or should I say good Friday morning to you all. It's lovely to have our whole church family here together uh, in the building and together in spirit joining us online. So welcome to you all. Today we come together to remember and reflect on Good Friday and remind ourselves anew of what the cross, which is so familiar to us all, means to us individually, to our society, to our world. Let me start in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Word. Be with us this morning as we worship you. May your Spirit change our hearts and minds. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, obviously, the cross is the big image of Good Friday, but I want to show you another image of Good Friday. A little bit out of focus, but this is Michelangelo's sculpture, La Pieta which depicts Mary, the mother of Jesus, holding his, Jesus' body after he has died. It's housed in St Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. And I was lucky enough to see this a few years ago and was absolutely stopped in my tracks. Mary's sorrow, Jesus' heavy broken weight in her, in her arms, her upturned palm to God. But what I feel when I look at this and what is at the centre of Good Friday is love. Mary's love for her son, God's love for his people, us. From John 3.16, for God so loved the world. From 1 John 4, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And from Romans 8.38, neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's stand together and sing how deep our Father's love for us. As we sing this song together this morning, we're reflecting on different things for all of us. Can I ask at the end of the song that you remain standing? A psalm will then be read and then we'll go in to sing another him after that. So please remain standing at the end of this.
first reading is from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Shines our 
I'm here to speak mostly to the children, but please continue listening. Um, children, you can stay with your parents. Um, just make sure you can see, because I'm going to hold some things up. So if you can see this, I think you can guess what it is. It's an ambulance. If you're in trouble and you see this, you know you're going to get help. They're going to take you where you can be cared for and treated. If you can see this, I wonder if you know what it is. It's called a lifesaver or a life preserver. If you're out in the water and you're in trouble and you see this, you know you're going to get help. You can hold on to this and they'll bring you to safety. We have a plan for when things go wrong. That's why we have ambulances and lifesavers. When things go wrong, we have a plan for how to save people. God had a plan for the world. He made the world. He made it with care and order, and it was good. But he knew it wouldn't always be good, and he knew we wouldn't always be good. God knew that we would sin. The Bible says that we all sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's falling short of God's perfect standards. It's turning away from God or saying no to God or ignoring God. The Bible says that our sin means we are all lost when it comes to God and we need his help. God knew that we would need help with our sin. So he had a plan. God's rescue plan was to send someone to rescue us. And not just anyone, he sent his son. God's son Jesus was sent by God to save us from our sin. It was God's plan for his son to die 
for us, to save us from our sin. When we look at the cross, we know that God has helped us. We have been rescued because Jesus died for us. When I was a child, I didn't go to church. I didn't read the Bible. I didn't know much about God. But then someone told me that God's son died for me so that I can be close to God. And then I knew how much God loved me. God the Father sent his one and only son to die for us, to save us. God the Son knew that he was going to die, but chose to come anyway because he loves us. And all according to God's rescue plan, Jesus didn't stay dead, but we'll hear more about that on Easter Sunday. For now, let's thank God for his plan to rescue us. Dear God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for sending your son to rescue us from our sin. Thank you that because of his death, we can be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. The second reading is from Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 through to the end of chapter 53. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form so marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. 
He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was out and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors this is the word of the lord Our last reading is taken from the New Testament, the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, beginning at verse 16b, found on page 879 of the Red Bibles and page 1543 of the Large Print Bibles. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant 
and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was a day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have them. Sorry, I'm all emotional. <laughs> they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus aside with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows he tells the truth, and he testifies, so that also you may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the true faithful word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome to St Mark's. My name is Tim and I'm the assistant minister here and it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Although pleasure is a difficult word to use as we see Andriana is struck by the motion as are so many of us on this morning. If you're here for the thousandth time or the first time or coming back after a long time, please feel most welcome. You'll see communication cards and welcome cards in front of you. If you have any feedback for us or you would like us to pray for you, the communication cards will only go to Vaughan, our vicar. And if you would like us to know who you are so we can connect with you, please fill out the welcome card and put them in the offertory basket when they go by. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to the Lord. Have you ever imagined what it must have been like in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? When Jesus is sung into Jerusalem, he is given a king's entrance. Everything, the donkey, the palm branches, the coats thrown on the ground, suggest the arrival of a conquering king. A conquered people the Jewish people have a Messiah. Imagine how the disciples felt, how people in that crowd felt, how the followers of Jesus felt, the joy and the excitement. 
But by Friday, those hopes are dashed. Jesus entered the city as a hero and is now crucified. And today, it's hard to understand what crucifixion meant, what it said about the person being crucified. So many of us here understand what happened on the cross is a beautiful thing. Crosses have become beautiful symbols. I have a couple that a dear friend gave me that I wear on my lapels. Many of you might be wearing them as a necklace. Some of you will have them as a tattoo, a reminder of what happened 2,000 years ago. The cross to the left of me looks quite nice too. It's simple but appealing. We're very used to the cross, so I think we might often not notice it. And I think because we're so used to the cross, even for those of us who don't come to church regularly or even believe in Jesus, I think two things may be possible. One, we forget what it meant for someone to be crucified, what the authorities were trying to do to them, and how people would have understood it at the time. The meaning ends up being drained. Or two, we might think the cross is irrelevant. I was in the city the other week going into the diocese and I was wearing my clerical collar as I do when I go into the diocese. And this man stopped me and he had a conversation with me. And part of his conversation was his disbelief that I would believe someone killed 2,000 years ago would have any relevance today. So you might be in a position where you've forgotten the meaning of the cross or it doesn't sit as deeply with you. Or you might be here because you always come on Good Friday and it might actually be not that relevant to you. It's so hard to try and understand what the cross meant to the three Marys, Disciple John, the soldiers and the crowd who would have cheered him in on Palm Sunday. But earlier this year, I had the pleasure of visiting the St. Mark's members of the congregation who go to Beach Mission in Lawn, And they meet in the Uniting Church. And I picked up the hymn book there, as I tend to do, and I looked through it, and I found this hymn by a man called Brian Wren, a hymn I've never heard, a hymn I will probably never hear heard sung in church, but whose verses help me understand what those people around the cross and in Jerusalem that day might have experienced more than many years at Theology College. I want to warn you, most people I've shown these verses to have recoiled. Parents, I know you have children here. The verses are not graphic. But, Neil, can we put the verses up on the screen, please? Here hangs a man discarded, a scarecrow hoisted high, a nonsense pointing nowhere to all who hurry by. Can such a clown of sorrows still bring a useful word where faith and love seem phantoms and every hope Absurd. If you're someone who loves Jesus, you probably find those words distressing. I don't know how they make you feel. Most people I've shown these lines to have found them confronting. One has said, isn't that heretical? But we're so used to the cross being a good thing for us. We've forgotten how the people standing around the cross would have understood the event. Jesus came into Jerusalem as a king, and he's crucified now. This is what the leaders who had Jesus crucified, this is what they would have wanted people to think, that this is the end of all rebels, of everyone who contests authority. They are discarded, and they are nothing more than nonsenses pointing nowhere. This was the point of crucifixion. Of about half a millennia, the Romans crucified tens and tens of thousands of people. The purpose of this was to create nonsenses pointing nowhere, to show those who may have followed rebels or risen against empire that this, this is what will happen to you. You become nothing more than a clown of sorrows where every hope people had in you becomes absurd. The Romans crucified tens of thousands of people But yet we have very little archaeological evidence of it. Not because it didn't happen, it's historically very well attested. But because what happened to those who was crucified was that they were thrown into a mass grave or that they were thrown into the rubbish pit. The purpose of crucifixion was to take those people who were especially troublesome people, 
and not just kill them, but to wipe them out of history, to say, you thought this was your king? You cheered him into this city. Look at him now. He is nothing more than a nonsense pointing nowhere. We can go back to the title slide. Thank you, Neil. Didn't every hope you had seem absurd? It's not just that crucifixion was a terrible word to what terrible way to die. It's a root word for excruciating. It is a weapon of oppression used by powerful empires to not just kill someone, not just execute someone, but to crush any future rebellions. Not a single person standing around that cross on Good Friday would have possibly thought that anyone would wear small crosses and necklace, that someone who was religious would wear it as a brooch. They would have agreed with the man who stopped me on the street and said, how can you believe that this day has any relevance? And that might be you today. You might have come today out of politeness or obligation to your family, or because you always come on Good Friday. You are most welcome at St. Mark's if that's you, and you will always be welcome here. We love it when people come with questions. But if you're someone with questions, can I encourage you to ask, is the cross relevant to me today? And to think about that. And we see it in our Old Testament readings today. They refer to Jesus, despised, rejected, beaten. Crucifixion was meant to destroy hope. And if it was meant as that, how today has it become something that is everywhere? Even people who don't believe in Jesus wear some quite nice crosses, I've noticed. Why do we have crosses everywhere in this church? If you're a child and you're finding it a little bit difficult to pay attention, that's okay. You could try counting all the crosses in this church. You might find it hard to do. Even the building we meet in is cross-shaped. Why is that? We know that Jesus is no nonsense pointing nowhere. We know that where he is, there is hope and faith abounds. But why? What happens on the cross? How does God take this dreadful attempt, this attempt to wipe Jesus out of history, so it has in fact become the turning point of history? The Apostle Paul thought a lot about this, and he wrote much about it, and he writes two really important things about the cross. In Galatians 3.13, and in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Galatians 3, he writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. In Corinthians, he wrote, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, these verses are summing up some quite complex theological thought, but what it boils down to is this. For the Apostle Paul, our sin, our wickedness, the shameful things we do are not just things we need forgiveness for, they're not just individual wrong actions taken by us, they are also active powers that hold us hostage. I think we understand this. If I said, come and whisper to me, the thing you're most ashamed of, and then I spoke it out into the microphone, I'm sure everyone has something they would dread to hear that happen to. And I get into a lot of trouble. But we also look at today's world, and we see that the shame and the sinfulness and the wickedness are not just individual actions, but they're forces that hold humanity in captive. We see this every day on the news. We see it daily in our lives among our friends and families. So what Paul is saying about Jesus is that somehow this man who is the son of God takes upon himself all our individual wickedness, all the individual things we do that are shameful to us, and, and he takes the powers that keep us captive, and on the cross they are put to death with Jesus. Jesus takes upon himself all the filth and the dreck, and the wretchedness of what and who we humans are and what we do, and they die with him. They are crucified with him. How does this happen? We understand that evil and the things we do that are shameful require a response. Maybe it's easier if we locate it outside ourselves. 
If someone has done something wrong, we want to see justice done. Someone we love has been hurt, we want to see the people who've hurt them be punished. Jesus is the one who is both powerful enough as God to make things right, and the one who is like us, a human, to represent us as the one who is guilty of all those evils. Jesus, who is God, who is part of the Trinity, became sin for you and me. Jesus, who John is so careful to show was there at the beginning of the world, the one through whom all things were made, the Lord of the universe, became a curse for you and for me. The great irony of the cross is that it was meant to make Jesus a nonsense pointing nowhere, but it is in fact the death knell of those things we do which cause us shame. It takes captive and destroys those things which held us captive. It's the death of those powers at work in the world. The cross was meant to end the hope of the people on Palm Sunday. But instead, Jesus becomes more than a regional king. Jesus saves the world from the powers of evil, from the things that we do that cause shame. Instead of just a regional king conquering Jerusalem, Jesus becomes a savior for the world. The crucifixion of Jesus was meant to make him a nonsense, but instead it destroyed the power of sin and the curse of the law over us. In this most awful of death, Christ defeats the powers of evil. It's like the gentleman who asked me why I believe. This is why I believe. Jesus put to death those things, and I use the word intentionally, that bedevil our world. And you might say, they're still bedeviling our world. We still act shamefully. The world still seems captive to those great evil forces. Laura read so well from Psalm 22, a psalm that Jesus quotes in other gospel accounts of the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is where we start at the cross. It seems like a nonsense pointing nowhere that God has forsaken us. It seems like all is at a loss. And it's easy to feel that in today's world. But we live in the point between that seeming forsakenness and each of the, the psalm and the reading from Isaiah start at that point of forsakenness, but they come to a place that match Jesus' final words in the Gospel of John. It is finished. Jesus is God choosing to bear the wrath and the punishment and the evil so that the powers might be destroyed, so that you might be set free, so that you might know God. Jesus is God himself, dying at the hands of oppressors so that we might know God, so that even the soldiers who crucified him, even the religious leaders and the political leaders who put him to death might know him. Jesus is the man who became sin for us so that we might be made right with God. Jesus is dead. The powers are defeated. We are made right with God. It is finished.
Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your life, your ministry, your death, and your resurrection. As we remember your death on the cross this Friday, may we also remember why you were there. That while we were still in our sin, you came and died for us. Thank you for your great love and mercy, for taking our place on the cross to make payment for what we've done wrong. Thank you for the forgiveness and the reconciliation that we now have with God because of your sacrifice. Thank you that as we read in Isaiah, by your wounds we are healed. Lord, we remember today the great cost at which we have peace with you. And we repent and turn from our sins that you died for. We pray for your forgiveness and renewal. Lord, thank you that in times of grief, loneliness, despair, regret, and suffering, we can be assured of your love for us when we look to the cross. Thank you for demonstrating your unconditional love in your death and your power to save us and to bring us new life in your resurrection. Jesus, we pray for the whole world that they may hear this good news of the gospel, that more people may come to know you as their sacrifice and saviour. We pray for the work of CMS, Open Doors, and other missionary organizations. Please bring them provision and guidance, and may you strengthen their missionaries by your spirit 
to persevere in their work for your kingdom. We pray that you would be working in them and in those that they care for, for the sake of your word, that you would continue to set people free from sin in your name. We pray for those going on holidays over Easter. May safety and joy follow them. We pray also for those who are seeking a saviour. May Easter be an opportunity for them to find you. And through this celebration, we pray that people may be reminded and encouraged by the historic reality of the cross. That your death, which changed the world, is still changing lives today. And we pray for courage as Christians to share this good news and message of hope that you came to save us. Jesus, thank you for making a way for us to enter your kingdom in heaven through the cross. That though our good actions are never enough to get us into heaven, thank you that your grace given to us by your death has made a way. We praise you for this gift of your righteousness, which we now hold in God's sight, given to us as you took our sin onto yourself. Lord, may we celebrate in this victory that Jesus has overcome our sin, our failures, and our shame. And we praise you, Jesus, that you are still alive and still saving and forgiving all who turn to you. Jesus, our servant, sacrifice, and king, we lift all these prayers up to you and ask that through them your will would be done. May all of this serve to bring to build your kingdom, and to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you'll now join me, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. To the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In a world where so much is questionable and uncertain, people look everywhere for hope in various ways, and this song sums it all up for us. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
praying for the offerings. Dear Father, thank you for the gifts given here this morning. We pray they be used to further your kingdom here in Camberwell and in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat. Well, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We will continue celebrating Easter on Sunday at 9, 11 and 6 p.m. So you're very, very welcome to join us for those services. I will close with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, the story of your suffering is written on our hearts and the salvation of the world is in your outstretched hands. Keep your victory always before our eyes, your praise on our lips, your peace in our lives. Amen.